everybody, welcome back to Recordology. Okay, guess who's way overdue for their haircut? I need to get to that, but today's not the day for that because we're doing something a lot more fun than that. So I was sitting in a meeting recently, I'll just say recently, and I got to thinking about how my beloved Pioneer tape deck is really ready to be upgraded at this point. It's got a couple of issues. We had the issue with the cord and now it shorts out on recording sometimes. Sometimes the logic controls fail. Uh, let's see what else. The illumination on the uh, display is really, really dim. And there have been just a, just a few issues with this deck that um, have kind of pushed it to the point of needing an upgrade. So I thought to myself, let's see if I can go find a nice three head tape deck, a single well tape deck. So I made a trip to a thrift store and on the very first attempt, I happened to find pretty much exactly what I was looking for. You're not gonna wanna miss this. This is Recordology. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna clean it up. We are going to open it up, see how it works, see what's all inside of it. I love doing that. Put it all back together and I'll give you guys a nice thorough test. And along the way, we'll talk about what to look for in a cassette deck if you're thinking about getting back into tapes as well because cassettes are having somewhat of a renaissance, not quite to the level of vinyl, but I love my cassettes. And if you have watched the show in the past, you know that we've reviewed a lot of tape stuff. So definitely one of my favorite things. Now we've reviewed quite a few cassette decks on this show. And one commonality is they all seem to turn into lengthy projects. So this, I really want a daily driver cassette deck. I don't want something that's going to be a project. I don't have to order belts. I don't want to have to, you know, adjust speed. I want it just to work. Is that asking too much? I just want it to work. So I'm hoping that's the case. I did not leave the store without first checking that it you know, played in both directions, rewind, fast forward, everything appears to be working. But as you can tell, it's it's a bit dusty. You know what I mean? It's, it's a dusty unit. This is the Yamaha Natural Sound Stereo Cassette Deck KX390 from 1996. They had these for about two years and discontinued them in 98. So it should be a good match for us and what we're uh, looking to do here in, in terms of replacing the other deck. And as we go through this, I'm just gonna kind of speak on some of my experience with cassettes and hopefully impart something of value. We're gonna start right here with disinfectant wipes. This is a huge invest, not huge, this is not a huge investment. This is an easy investment, but this is hugely important because you can kill viruses with this stuff. You can also cosmetically truly improve your investment. And I want to get the dust off of this unit right away. Now, does my wife know that I have this tape deck on the kitchen counter? Yes, she does. She's very gracious. And I need to get this cleaned up and corrected right away because I don't want to push my luck here. So we're going to start by unwrapping this, cleaning this thing up, making it so clean you can eat off of, although I would still recommend not doing that, seeing as dust is primarily dead skin cells of humans. So let's go ahead and wipe the dead skin cells right off of this unit and try to affect some immediate positive change. I'm going to do the easy stuff first, the front or the sides, the back, and then we will do the front as well. Yoshi the bird has decided now is the time to start going crazy and making sound. So, cassette decks. I was talking to a friend this morning. I don't know why today's a day for tapes, but I was talking to a friend this morning who's thinking about getting back into cassettes as well. And one thing I mentioned was that when it comes to tapes, unlike vinyl in my opinion, vintage truly is better because nowadays the only cassette deck mechanism being made as a Chinese clone of a 1980s cheap design by a company called Tanishin or Tanashin. And that clone shows up on every unit, mostly with mono heads, which have a DC bias. 
And that's not a great thing because bias when it comes to cassette decks is much more effective when it's AC bias. We've done an entirely separate show about that. If you wanna learn about AC bias versus DC bias, then check out the link in the description below for that show. Essentially, it boils down to this. In order to achieve a quality recording on magnetic tape, you have to feed voltage into the audio signal. It basically forces the recording into the higher frequency, higher coercivity zone and allows a linear recording. What does that mean? It means it sounds normal. If you were to not have any bias on your cassette recording, it would just sound like garbage and we don't like that. So the original bias was DC, meaning that they just literally fed DC voltage in and that's the cheapest and easiest way to do it. They found out later that you could use alternating current via AC bias and achieve a much better result. And that became the standard. So everything produced from, I would say, probably the early 70s until the early 2000s was AC bias because that was the standard. That's good quality. But now that we've reverted back to a modern era of tape decks that are using clone tannishin mechanisms, they're back to using the DC bias because it's cheaper, it's easier to, it physically works, but we've done sound tests and that video will show you, you know, AC versus DC bias and what they sound like. This is very much an AC bias thing. So when it comes to tape decks, you don't wanna go too old, you go 70s or 80s, you're gonna run into a lot of issues with things like uh, belts, uh, faulty motors, circuit boards and things like that. So I would go late 90s like this unit right here. My Pioneer is 96, I believe. This is 96. Little life hack, every cassette deck pretty much that I've ever touched, you can pop the door off to allow you to clean the door and also access the inside of the unit a lot easier. We're gonna take a closer look at all of this stuff, but right now I just wanna finish getting it all cleaned up and we'll go from there. Okay, so welcome to the inner workings of this single well tape deck. And speaking of single well, you may be saying to yourself, why does it only have one deck? Well, that is an interesting point. It less is more when it comes to cassette decks. Decks that have only one well are considered to be higher end. You play, you record, all from one unit. A dual deck cassette player is considered more of a consumer device because they're designed to dub tapes, which was pretty huge in the late 80s, or all of the 80s and the 90s. I definitely did my share of tape dubbing. And But if you wanna play and record quality cassettes, a single well mechanism is ideal. So you will notice that there are two heads here. It is a two head deck. The best of the best have three heads, and I'll explain why in a minute. But basically you got the erase head on the left, and you've got the record slash play head in the middle there, and the pinch roller on the right, and the little metallic cap stand that drives the entire operation. And the spools, they take up slack, but the tape is driven through the mechanism with that cap stand. So we wanna start by cleaning these heads. This is, a, this is mandatory when you buy a new deck, you wanna make sure that these heads are cleaned. Obviously this is a stereo head. You can tell because there's two black sections there and there's a line down the middle, basically separating the left and right channel. It's also recommended that you clean the erase head with the alcohol as well. The pinch roller, only if it looks dirty. There's some debate about whether isopropyl alcohol will erode the rubber on the pinch roller. So I typically only clean the pinch roller if necessary, but do clean the cap stand itself. It's pretty tight fit, so I'm not gonna do all of that on camera, but I am definitely gonna do that next. And let's take a look at the front panel after that. But first I wanna follow up with what I was talking about in regards to three head tape decks. Those use a separate head to record, erase, and play back. The benefit is when you're listening to your recording in real time, you're hearing it off the tape, not off the record head. One thing that's right off the bat pretty interesting is you'll notice that there's this little flexible pad on the inside of the cassette door. And when you close the cassette door, it goes vertical. So it literally helps clamp the cassette in position up against the spools, which in turn makes sure that the tape is positioned securely over the head without it rattling around. Okay, we're gonna put the cover on. It just snaps down just like that. 
So cassette stabilizer must be that little door we were talking about. But what is GF head? That's a good question. Well, GF stands for glass ferrite, which is the substance that the head is made out of. And a glass ferrite head is much more long lasting and wear proof than a typical head. So that's great news. Basically, it means that the head will last a lot longer. And that's a great thing. Anything that lasts longer increases the chances that this will work for us. Also, one of the things that I recommend doing when you're contemplating purchasing a cassette deck that's vintage like this is take your fingernail and gently run it over the playhead forward and back a little bit. It should be perfectly smooth. That's a good way to test whether or not the head is worn out. Just your fingernail on the head forward and back a little bit like that and it should feel smooth as glass whether or not you have a glass ferrite head or not. It should be smooth as glass a worn head will actually start to have ridges in it where that tape path has worn down the head. So you'd want to avoid a worn head. They can be replaced, but again, I don't want to replace things. I want it to work out of the box. This one is perfectly smooth as glass, and it's pretty much ready to go. After cleanup, you know, dust covers stuff, and as you can tell, we've got some nicks over here, cosmetic stuff, scratches on that front plate. But overall... It's in great condition and in a darkened room where it's going to live in, at the end of the day, it should be, you know, it should look fantastic. So let's look at some of the buttons and features on the front panel. Nothing more fun than highly reflective surfaces, so bear with me here. Once again, this is the Yamaha Natural Sound Stereo Cassette Deck KC or KX390. Natural Sound was sort of their branding for their stereo components. So you can get natural sound CD players, natural sound tape players, etc., etc. Uh, here is the power switch. Right down here is the eject. It does have a mechanically operated eject mechanism. Some super high-end ones will actually have a, a, an actual server control or servo controlled eject, which is really, really cool. This one does not. Moving down here a little bit, we can see my reflection in the unit, which is awesome. Uh, but besides that, we also see some features that we should take a look at. So I'm gonna preface this by saying that this unit originally came with a remote control that I do not have. So there will be some controls that I will not be able to do from the front panel, but the most important ones I can. So I will be able to reset the counter in the upper left-hand corner. I probably won't be able to set or recall memory settings on the counter, although I don't anticipate needing to do that. It does have a headphone amplifier built in so you can plug in your headphones and listen directly. Also, while you have the chance, you can clean out the headphone jack because there's surely some dust in there. You have your headphone level, that's the volume of the headphones, a bias adjust. Now what on earth? So we talked about bias before and tape decks, modern ones, more modern ones I should say, typically have presets for different tape types. So you have type one ferric oxide tape, you have type two chromium tape, you have type four metal tape, and the tape deck will sense that using little fingers that feel the top of the tape. So those presets that are built into this deck can be fine tune adjusted. Obviously this is sort of an expert setting, but if you know what you're doing, you have that ability. There's also a play trim adjustment, not something that you see on tape decks very often. We have automatic tape tuning. Now this is really exciting because when you start talk about tape calibration and tape tuning, bias adjustment, these are features that in the past or in general, have only been seen on Nakamichi level tape decks, which is sort of the Rolls Royce of cassette decks to many people. So Yamaha with this series was kind of famous for bringing a lot of those Nakamichi end features, high end, super high end features to more of a mid range product like this. So you actually get auto tape tuning, which is an amazing feature. Uh, no surprise, in this era they were still Dolby. Modern tape decks no longer have Dolby as they're not licensing their technology out anymore. But this has Dolby B, Dolby C. It has an MPX setting which will extend that headroom as well as HX Pro which further accentuates that headroom giving you a very dynamic, high fidelity recording. I do want to mention too, back on the bias adjust, a record only setting. It doesn't make any difference on playback. Finally, here on the right, we have the transport controls. So stop, play, intro, scan, fast forward, rewind, a record pause switch, as well as a mute 
and search switch. So a very full featured deck. Again, this is a mid range tape deck. So this was a 200 ish dollar unit back in the day. So a decent investment, not super high end, but not entry level. Let's look on the back. By the way, Yamaha Corporation got its start in the 1890s. In Japan, they originally made an organ, if you can believe it. And now the company does everything, as you know, everything from motorcycles to electronics. It's just amazing. All right, the only thing back here for us is line input and line output, obviously analog. Not gold terminals, just silver terminals, but effective. This is a plastic back panel, just as a point of information there. I don't really have a feeling about that. I feel like by the late 90s, a lot of back panels were plastic. I remember seeing that on a lot of VCRs as well. The top and sides is a sort of a form-fitting top-down shell, as is common. The chassis is built from bottom up. So when we remove the screws to look inside, this will come off like a shell, and we'll see everything mounted on that bottom chassis. Okay, moment of truth. Let's see what's inside. I don't know why it's a moment of truth. We're going to find out what's inside one way or another. All right, so I removed four screws from the sides, one from the back, and it's just going to hinge up and out. Ah. All right, let's see what we're dealing with here. Pretty cavernous, not surprising. Let's take a look at some of the components that we're seeing in here. See some ICs, I see a Dolby chip, I see Yamaha chips. Not surprisingly, it wouldn't surprise me if we saw something from another company in here on one of these chips. Let's take a closer look and see what we got there. That big one there is Yamaha. Not uncommon to see Texas Instruments, Toshiba. Kind of hard to see with the camera right here, but from what I can tell, can you guys spot any other brands? I love how the circuit board is laid out very clearly. This is like very repair friendly. I can tell you right off the bat, all little capacitors there. Hopefully nothing is blown. Trim pots here and there. You can make adjustments. All the sections are very well labeled, which is great to see. Over here, we've got the power supply, which is isolated. Although surprisingly not shielded, usually they'll have a piece of metal shielding that area. Apparently it's sufficient not to have that. We do have ribbon cables connecting things. I can't tell if those are removable clips on there or not there's the back of the front panel circuit board but most importantly we're here to see this guy right here this is the deck itself so let's get a better angle on that okay so we have an off-the-shelf mabuchi motor it is a single motor tape deck which is a little bit surprising i would expect a high-end unit or a mid-range unit like this to have dual motors but that's okay all can be achieved via gearing and belts. The belts on this are okay. The flat belt, uh, the, the tightness is fine. The flat belt feels a little dry, a little, I can't tell if it's brittle, I'm not gonna test it, but I don't think it'll slip, but only time will tell. So it may need belts. Well, it's going to at some point in time, but that's essentially the mechanism. To see what that looks like. Also, I need to clean up some more of that dust there on that front edge, but that's really all there is to it. It's a simple, simple device okay so i've gone ahead and taken the liberty of installing it into my system sorry it's a little messy on the bottom there you can see those cables down there um from my angle it looks fine those are kind of hidden unless the camera's down low like this um, i've also chosen not to put the ring light on because i want you to kind of be able to see the ambient lights also to see how they compare to other equipment like the mini display or above it so I play with it a little bit. It seems like it's in pretty dang good condition. So I've got three basic tape types here. I've got type one on the left, type two in the middle, and type four metal on the right. Uh, I wanna talk about how this recognizes the type of tape that you're putting in it. And again, it comes down to these notches on top. So the tape on the bottom, the clear one there is type one, and you can see the position of those notches. Type two is the next one up where those notches are slightly differently positioned. And then on the top, metal tape. That tells the tape deck what type of bias to use. But again, you can manually tweak that if you want to. That's beyond what we're gonna do in today's video. But let's start by just demonstrating how it recognizes the tape type. Okay, so you can see 
type one, we take type one tape out, we put in tape two, type two tape two, <laughs> and you can see it changes to two with a higher bias. And finally, the metal tape, type four metal. So that's cool that it not only senses the tape, my old Pioneer did that as well, but it tells you right on the display there exactly what you have inserted. Okay, we got this awesome tape here made by Fartimark. Let's go ahead and insert it there. And I will do a stereo test where you guys can hear how good the sound quality is on my monitors here in the room. But to begin with, I just wanted to, we're just gonna play it ambiently. So you're gonna hear in the background the sound, but uh, the microphone's not really pointed in that direction. So you can see what the VU meter looks like there. To the eye, it looks a bit brighter and sharper and also more uniform. On camera, it looks like some of those notches are kind of reddish, but they all look like a, a uniform orange color. And then the numbers to the right of zero there, zero included, are red. Now you'll notice that the little Dolby symbol's a little bit to the left of the zero. That's because when you're making a Dolby recording, which obviously this can do, you want it to peak, not at zero, but you want to set that peak at the Dolby mark, which in this case is a little bit to the left of zero. Okay, let's go ahead and make our recording. For that, we're going to be using this lovely TDK Type 1 tape, also known as Ye Old Test Tape. I'm going to put it in like that. And we're going to hit the record button, which will allow the signal that it is sourced to, that the input is connected to, which in this case is a mini disc player, to come through. And right now it's not recording yet, it's just passing that signal through so we can set the level using the level adjustment. So normally you would have it peak right about there, right at zero. Analog tape, unlike digital, has headroom so you're able to actually have it peak a little bit above without distorting, but I usually aim for the zero mark. I have a tendency of recording hot and that comes from my broadcast days perhaps. A lot of people say you should really have it peaking more in the negative 12 decibel zone. That way if there's a loud crash or something, you've got plenty of headroom, but I like to give it a little bit more punch. So I peak usually right about zero. And the, my thought is if the, the stronger the signal is on that tape, the less hiss you're gonna have because you're increasing the signal to noise ratio by having a louder signal. So right now we're peaking right at about zero, but because we're making a Dolby recording, which we get to by selecting this button, it toggles to B, C, and then off. So we're gonna set it to B. And like I said before, we want it to peak at that Dolby symbol, not at the zero. So it looks like it's set just about right. Once the level is set, we can reset the counter and then just hit play. And it is now recording the source that we have selected. And I'm gonna play this back on uh, with the stereo mic and now it's fading out so we're gonna get <laughs> we're gonna get the end of this song and, and the beginning of the next let's see let's go ahead and speed it up a little bit here let's go to track three and let's go to track four something that's a little bit more interesting cool So, obviously there was a little bit of an issue on playback there. I don't think it's a dropout. It doesn't sound like a dropout to me. It sounds like bad tape. 
That is a Type 1 tape that I've used over and over and over. It could be just worn out. Also, I have a vague memory of that tape becoming unthreaded, possibly on that sharp schoolroom player and me having to rethread it. So tape that you've had to handle, tape that's crinkled, can do that. So that's probably what it was. Once that part of the tape passed, it actually sounded really good. The Fidelity sounded noticeably better to my ears than my Pioneer. So that HX Pro, the Dolby obviously, and any other technologies that Yamaha introduced in that unit or employed in that unit, I should say, were really shining through. So at the end of the day, I think we have a good solid performer. Let me know down in the comments below if you have this deck or if you've had it in the past, or what do you use to listen to tapes on? I would love to hear more about it. But that is going to do it for today. I want to say before we go that we've got a surprise coming your way in the near future, something pretty exclusive and interesting that we are going to be bringing to you. So you'll want to stay tuned in future shows for that. And also, don't forget, you can buy us a coffee if you feel so led, and that will help support the channel and allow us to buy more cool products to review as well. You can also buy Recordology merch, which is awesome. And you can also send us records, which we will review on the show as well. But anyway, guys, that's going to do it for now. Thanks for watching. Happy record hunting. We'll see you next time.